Okay, uh, the pancreas. Um, this one gets kind of complicated, especially since I really, really want you guys to start gaining an understanding of diabetes, diabetes mellitus, type 1 and type 2. So I would highly recommend that you read the diabetes information in your textbook. If you don't have a textbook, have somebody copy that part out for you. And at the end of this set of notes, if you scroll down, there is a link to um, the Genetic Science Learning Center at the University of Utah. They have some really good teaching materials. This is an interactive, it's not just a video, um, about diabetes specifically, and it gives you things to do. Um, introduction to diabetes, it does type 1 and type 2. It's really pretty fantastic. Being diagnosed. Um, and um, it will help you get the understanding that you might not get the first time I um, go through this. Okay, so first off, let's talk about just a normal pancreas doing normal pancreas stuff. Location of your pancreas, you probably remember from anatomy. It's generally, um, it's like described as being in that first curve of your small intestine, just beneath your liver in the first curve of your small intestine. And it really doesn't look like anything impressive anatomically, but it sure as hell is important. <clears throat> so the pancreas has two functions. One of them you covered back in the metabolism chapter because of course the pancreas makes digestive enzymes, but we're not concerned about that functionality of the pancreas right now. <clears throat> right now we are concerned about its endocrine functionality, which is its ability to release hormones. And so if you look at the pancreas, the pancreas has exocrine portions and endocrine portions. If you took a chunk of pancreas, the exocrine portions are on the outside and the endocrine portions are on the inside. And there are three kinds of cells that are involved in there. I don't care if you can um, identify them in the picture because they don't look like that for in real life anyway. <clears throat> but you can see this little structure right here that has the endocrine function in the middle um, is called a pancreatic islet or they used to call them islets of Langerhans, which is way more fun to say. Um, and there are three relevant cells in there. The alpha cells produce and secrete glucagon. And we know that you need glucagon when your glucose is gone because we learned about that in the metabolism chapter. And the beta cells secrete insulin. <clears throat> Talk about that in just a minute. And then there is a third type of cell called a delta cell. And the delta cell, we don't talk about a whole heck of a lot. It does secrete a third hormone called somatostatin. <clears throat> somatostatin um, was also the name of a different hormone released from the um, uh, hypothalamus, but that's not the same somatostatin here. So where it, the somatostatin is going to, its primary function is just going to be that <clears throat> it allows the pancreas to be sensitive to when to stop secreting insulin or glucagon. So you don't really know, need to know too much about somatostatin. <clears throat> so I do want to talk about glucagon and I want to talk about insulin. So let's start talking about each one of these. So the alpha cells um, in the pancreas will respond to low levels of plasma glucose by secreting glucagon because your glucose is gone. And glucagon will do anything necessary to increase circulating nutrient levels, okay? Primarily it's focused on glucose, but it also has some impact over here to spare the glucose for the brain. <clears throat> so what kinds of things will glucagon do? Glucagon is going to go primarily to the liver and it will do glycogenolysis first. I wish they had put that first, breaking down stored glycogen. And then if necessary, it will do gluconeogenesis, making amino acids into glu glucose, which will then send back into the bloodstream. And primarily this glucose is for the brain. So what glucagon also does is causes the adipose tissue to do lipolysis so that other tissues can use those fatty acids as a nutrient source to spare the glucose for the brain. But this is the biggie that it does right here. <clears throat> so now let's look at this. What is the feedback mechanism for glucagon? Remember, there are three types of feedback. You have hormonal feedback when a hormone feeds back and tells you to stop secreting a hormone. You have neural feedback isn't very easy to draw, but it's like when the nervous system turns it on and then something changes about the nervous system and turns it off. 
And then you have a non-hormone substance. When that feeds back, that's called humoral feedback. And that's what you've got here because the thing that, fe that is feeding back <clears throat> is a nutrient or ion. And in this instance, it's glucose that feeds back. I've got plenty of glucose. Stop, um, stop secreting glucagon. Okay, so that's how glucagon works. And then insulin is pretty easy because it's pretty much the opposite. Um, so insulin is released in response to high blood plasma glucose. And what it's trying to do is, of course, decrease blood plasma glucose. And what it's going to do is a bunch of things, but the big picture thing is anything necessary to drop your blood glucose levels. So of course it goes to most tissues in the body, not all tissues. Any tissue that has a receptor for insulin will increase glucose up, uptake into the cells. So the glucose was in the blood plasma, take it into the cells, that drops it in the blood plasma. So that accomplishes the goal. But then in addition, if you still have enough, it's gonna to go to the liver and the muscle, remember and increase glycogen synthesis, glycogenesis, and of course decrease glycogenolysis, because you don't want to do like glycogenolysis because that would increase your level of plasma glucose and that's not what we're trying to do. And then also, if the liver was doing gluconeogenesis, don't do that anymore, right? So it's gonna stop that, stop that, okay? And then all of these together are going to serve to decrease your blood plasma glucose, which will then feed back through the bloodstream to stop insulin secretion. And so I asked you the question again, what's the feedback mechanism for insulin? <clears throat> it's still humoral feedback, right? It is a nutrient or ion that is feeding back through the bloodstream, not a hormone and not the nervous system, okay? So <clears throat> if we very simply, let's just draw this a little bit simpler, okay? So draw the feedback mechanisms for insulin and glucagon above. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay. So if we, let's do um, glucagon first just because it was written first. So you need glucose when, you need glucagon when your glucose is gone. So let's talk. Uh, low glucose goes to the pancreas, specifically it's the alpha cells, and the pancreas secretes glucagon, and one of glucagon's primary targets, the biggie, is the liver, okay? And the liver does everything that it can to increase um, the amount of glucose in the bloodstream, including glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. And that will increase glucose. And here's the important part again. What is it that feeds back? It's the glucose, not the glucagon, that feeds back to the pancreas, right? And tells me to stop doing that because I have accomplished my goal. So that's the first one. Um, and then let us do insulin, which is basically just kind of the opposite story. And you release insulin in response to high blood plasma glucose. And again, it goes to the pancreas, but this time we're gonna speak to the beta cells in the pancreas. And they are going to respond by secreting insulin. And insulin is going to go to most cells plus the liver. And although I don't have room to write it, what happens there is that most cells increase glucose uptake and the liver does glycogenesis, okay? And both of those together are going to cause a decrease in blood glucose. And then again, big picture understanding is that I am going to use the decrease in glucose to feed back to the pancreas to know when to stop secreting insulin. So those are both fantastic examples of what we call humoral feedback, in which it's a nutrient or an ion 
Okay, so now I just want to get you guys started thinking about type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Actually, I'll stop here and then do type 1 and type 2 diabetes.